Professor Kim for all the arrangement, a lot of work for him. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is some of our past, uh, you know, few years of work on switching diffusion processes. So you will probably ask the question, what is this switching diffusions? What applications they can give us? Uh, we'll see that in the, in the talk. So before I get started, let me mention some of my uh, co-authors of related work. Uh, Hasminski is my colleague from the same department. He's retired uh, probably more than 80, 88 or so years old. Uh, my former student now is at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Uh, he, Qin Shou Su, actually visited uh, Kest some time ago. Uh, maybe twice, actually, from what I know. Also, a former student. Another former student from uh, Melbourne, uh, a colleague from uh, UK, and uh, a colleague from uh, Hua Zhong University, and uh, another colleague from UK as well. So. Uh, so here is an outline of my talk. What I'm going to talk about is basically the first part is what the switching diffusions are. And uh, then I'll give some examples. And uh, the third part will be properties of that. Uh, I, I will try not to get into the technical details, hopefully. And uh, then, sorry? Oh. The third part will be the explosion, suppression, and the stabilization. And then we'll talk about some numerical solution. First, the caustic control and, uh, and the game problems. And finally, we'll conclude the talk. So you may ask the question, what are switching diffusions? So uh, let me begin with that. Should I use that one? All right, thank you. Is that one working? All right, so now to have a demonstration, I have a, a, a graph here. It's really a demonstration of what the switching diffusions are. Here I have a three parallel plans. Parallel plan number one, parallel plan number two, and uh, number three. So basically, a switching diffusion is one which has both continuous component and the discrete component. So the plans are the discrete component. Now on each of the plan, you have a diffusion. So for example, on the first plan, you see I have a diffusion. The only thing is that the curve here is too smooth. The actual diffusion is not a differentiable, as you know. But uh, I can only draw the smooth curve <laughs> so as a demonstration. So at some random time, it jumps to the third plan and follows another diffusion. And then another time, it jumps again into another plane or plan and follows another diffusion and so on and so forth. It's the both component, the both the continuous, the continuous, this one. I don't mean the continuous time, I mean the continuous state. And also the discrete state are the three discrete values. So that constitutes the, the switching diffusion. Now, why is a switching <coughs> diffusion needed? It is needed because a lot of applications really require that. That's the reason that we are looking into that. So here, I outlined a few things. So problem naturally arise in the fo following problems, like uh, distributed cooperative and non-cooperative games, wireless communications, target tracking, and so on and so forth. So all of this, we do have a real applications associated with that. One of the key point we want to bring is that the traditional ordinary differential equation and the stochastic differential equation models are no longer adequate. So we need something more than that. So, and the distribution is not a Gaussian. It's non-Gaussian. It's something like a Gaussian mixture. All right. So let me write down the, the setup here. So I have a discrete event which taking values in a set from 1 to m. And the alpha is the switching process 
that takes values in M. And I have a WT, which is a standard Brownian motion. And I have the drift and the diffusion coefficient. Then I can write down the stochastic differential equation. Now, if you look at this differential equation, you see very much similar to what you learned in the class with the SDE, except there is a blue thing, the alpha t, which is added. The added alpha actually makes things much more difficult. So here, the transition probability, say alpha t from i to j, so it's like a Markov chain. But here, we don't assume that. In fact, if it is a Markov chain, this one will be a constant qij. But here, this qij actually depends on the diffusion process. So that makes things a lot more different. Difficult. Let's see. So here I emphasize that the Q, in fact, is X dependent. So you have this uh, structure. This is uh, similar to the Markov uh, generator of a Markov chain. The generator of a Markov chain, we all know. The off diagonal elements are greater than or equal to zero. The row sum is equal to zero, and so on and so forth. And then we can write down the generator of the two component process, which have the following form. The first two terms are S in the diffusion, but you have an additional one. The additional one actually is a matrix multiplication. Really is a matrix multiplication. So you have, a, you have the following thing. So the gradient is denoted by nabla, and this one is nabla square we denote by Hashin matrix. So what are the main difficulties? Suppose I have uh, the process xt alpha t with two different uh, initial conditions. One of them I start with x and alpha. The other one I start with y and alpha. So the discrete component I start at the exactly the same place. But the continuous one I start at the different one. x and y are different. Then what happens is that you will see the switching process will be infinitely often different. So uh, even though at the very beginning they are the same, but they actually, as you go on, they become different. So if you want to subtract one process from the other, you can't quite do that. So things become much more complicated. We'll see that. And here that says, you know, this switching process, I can rewrite it in a way as a stochastic integral, another stochastic integral. So the alpha I can rewrite as a <coughs> stochastic integral with respect to some uh, pause on random measure, and I have a second stochastic differential equation. So you can put them together, you can get the Ito formula, but the Ito formula is more complicated than what you learned from the usual stochastic differential equation. Because here you have a two martingales. One martingale is due to the Brownian motion. The other martingale is due to the switching process. All right. So, uh, so you said, you know, what, what is all this about? You know, can we have some more specific examples? So now let's look at, let's look at the following problem. This one is simply an ordinary differential equation, but with switching. So the A matrix is not a constant matrix, but depending on a continuous time Markov chain. So I have the differential equation. It's like a usual ODE, except that the A, you have a two values. One is one, A1 equal to this, A2 equal to that. And the generator of the Markov chain is given by this. So corresponding to A1, I have a one linear system. Corresponding to A2, I have another linear system. What about if I couple them together? How the system look like? You see, in this case, I don't even have a diffusion. I just have a Markov chain switching. Now, if you see, I, I draw the face portrait of those two systems. One is this one. We, we all know this one corresponding to a center, right? Because you know, the eigenvalue, you can see it. Whereas this one corresponding to a stable node. So if I draw 
the picture of that starting both at the same place, say at this point, the stable node will get you to the zero pretty fast. Whereas the center, you know, just go around, follow this curve. What happens if you do this by couple this, uh, those two curves, you know, one is center, the other one is stable node. The picture becomes like this, interesting, right? So starting at this point, you follow the first circle for some time, and then the switch, you know, the switching process takes place at some random time. It switch in, the radius becomes smaller. At the very beginning, the radius is like one, for example, like if you are looking at a uh, unit circle. And here the radius becomes smaller, and the switch again, the radius becomes smaller and smaller, and so on and so forth. So eventually, it get to the, the point of uh, zero. So you still have asymptotic stability, starting from the point one one at this point. So that tells you, you know, what kind of feature you can see from the switching process. Uh, Actually, something is more interesting. In ordinary differential equation, we all know there is a well-known theorem known as hartmann grobman theorem, which says the nonlinear system and the linearized system are topologically equivalent. If, if what? If they are, if there are eigenvalues of a certain type, but if it's a center, it won't work because it's not the case. But here, you see, even if you have a center, but if the switching gives you enough force, push enough, you still get the asymptotic equivalent of the nonlinear system and the linearized one. So that's the first message we try to get a, across. Now let's look at another example. Now here is no no Brownian motion, no uh, no sweet, uh, no diffusion yet, but even just a very simple linear system. So this problem come from the feedback control of linear systems. I have a x dot equal to a alpha t x times b alpha t u, where u is the control. And then you use some feedback control. The feedback control is of the form k alpha t times x t. Then you can rewrite this ordinary differential equation in the following way. Uh, I, I should say the feedback should be negative. I, I forgot the negative sign, so that's why here is minus that stuff. So now you put them together. Uh, then you give the alpha t again. I'm going to look at the simple case alpha t is a Markov chain and takes two values. So here I have a A1 minus B1 times K1 equal to this. This is the one. A2 minus B2 K2 equal to that quantity. If you look at those two matrices, then you see both of them are stable matrices in the sense all the eigenvalues are on the left half of the complex plan. Okay, so no problem at all. Uh, but now you add a switching uh, mechanism. So we are really looking at the alpha t now. So for each individual one, both of them are stable. Now let me ask the question, what about if I couple them by using a switching process? Is it true I always get a stable differential equation? Basically, it's this. I have a two systems. Both are just linear. Both of them are stable. I couple them together by using some switching mechanism. I ask the question whether or not the resulting one will be stable. Intuitively, you think, you know, if everything is right, then nothing should be wrong. <laughs> but it turns out, you know, even if you do deterministic uh, switching, if you switch that every point one second, that's my colleague look at uh, this problem before from control theory. So here is the curve they obtain. Now what is that? This one is time. 
whereas this one is the norm of x, you have a two component. So this norm is x1 square plus x2 square. Take the square root of that. It's simply the Euclidean norm. So what you observe here is that you have something blow up going to infinity. By simply couple two stable system, you can produce something unstable. That seems to be funny or, you know, how do you explain that? Uh, actually, they, 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 they observed that, but they didn't really uh, explain what is going on. However, we can, we can really explain this. So if you take an average of those two matrices, uh, then what you see is the average, the average, I mean by adding them up, divide by one half, you get this one. This one turns out to be an unstable matrix, meaning one eigenvalue is on the left half of the complex plan, the other one on the right half of the complex plan. So the, the average effect act, actually dominate the dynamics. So how do you, yeah? Actually, really dynamics really just follow this average. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, mean of the basically it has something to do with the switching frequency. If you don't switch too frequently, you won't get to the average. But if you switch very frequently, you get to the average. Which, if we look at the corresponding stochastic system, I put a small parameter there. So alpha t now is generated by a constant generator divided by epsilon. So the epsilon is when speed up the, uh, the, the frequency of the switching. Then what happens is that you can show there is a limit problem. The limit problem, in fact, is the B here is the average with respect to the stationary measure of this matrix Q. So this average thing actually take place. And then we can use the so-called perturbed Lyapunov function method to prove that you know, if epsilon is small enough, now if this one is unstable, then this one is unstable as well. It has something to do with the switching frequency. If you don't switch that frequently, you don't observe that. Uh, likewise, oh, by the way, Likewise, you may ask the question, if I have a two unstable system put together, can I get a stable system? Yes, you can. So all of the, all sort of weird stuff you can observe in this, uh, in this uh, event. So the dynamic system has a lot of new features than what you normally see in the, you know, the traditional dynamic system. So now, let me present some examples of uh, uh, regime switching uh, diffusions. The first example comes out also from control theory. Suppose I have the switching diffusion given by this, and then I want to find uh, the optimal control, which is a function depending on this, so that this long run average cost will be minimized. So that's my objective. Now, when you do that, when you do this, uh, you, you would ask, you know, uh, can I replace this one by something simpler, by average with respect to the stationary measure or invariant measure? But if you want to do that, you have to confirm there is an invariant measure. And then you need the condi conditions to guarantee that, you know, under certain conditions, there are such invariant measures or ergodic measures. <laughs> now, the second example, like I, the lecture I, I gave yesterday, is about switching uh, mark of chance. In this case, you have a fast switching, you also have a slow one. And if you look at the, the corresponding uh, occupation measure, it turns out the occupation measure has a limit. The limit scale, the occupation measure has a limit, which is uh, switching diffusion. The next example tells you 
the kind of application you encounter in the so-called Markov decision process. You have a fourth state, but they divide it into two groups. In each of the group, the transition happen pretty frequently, but the transition from this group to that group and from that group to this group back is relatively infrequently. So this fast and the slow motion and the weak and the strong interaction give rise to the, the limit that we are interested in. This one is my favorite example of many discrete state. I do aggregation by considering all the states in this cluster as one super state, here as another super state. So all together, I will I'll have a six state. The question is, can I get some limit result? It turns out you also get the limit switching diffusion. If you look at this picture, it looks like nothing it has nothing to do with, with diffusion or switching or anything, right? So it's actually flocking bunch of birds going to certain direction. Uh, I'll say what, what I would like to say. The next picture comes out from a, a paper appeared in Nature 205 by Cousin and his group. They were trying to study the animal behavior uh, of, you know, like a fish and others. Uh, the next one is actually what we have been doing for uh, a project we, we, we did for so-called fiber cyber physical systems. So you have a uh, unmanned vehicle on the highway moving, uh, hopefully it's a platoon, and we have a wireless communication between those. We use a LiDAR and the radar to detect uh, those. We want to reach certain coordination for those vehicles. The next one also from nature, uh, again, is for honeybee organization. All those pictures I, I showed before uh, actually comes out to be something becomes a, a relatively interesting topic or interested by many people called a consensus. The consensus is, you know, either animal or some, some other, uh, uh, you know, mobile agent or so on and so forth, they try to do some organization or reach some agreement. So here I have a, you know, a list of references just in case you are interested in. So the multi-agent coordination is a group of object. For example, alignment during motion or UAV uh, to maintain shared information and so on and so forth. So the, actually one of the first paper talk about that, uh, appeared in 1995, uh, appeared in Physics Review, as uh, by Wiesenczak and his colleagues. They were looking at something called a mobile agent. Those are, if you think, you can think about the, those are points on a plan. They all move in the same speed, but with different hiding. But during the movement, they compute and they communicate, eventually reach some agreement, so they all go to the same direction. This also appeared in, for example, like a social networks and the other things. Uh, so far, you see it here, there is no switching, but our work is considered for, instead of fixed configuration, we consider this topology could switch. And you also have a multi-scale system in that case, you get a switching diffusion limit. The next example comes out from physics. It's the so-called uh, mean field models. Now, the mean field models attracted a lot of attention recently, especially in, in people for, for people in control theory. But this example I'm putting in here is a reflection of the famous probabilist uh, uh, Dawson did in 1975. So in physics, people are trying to solve the n-body problems, but here I put l-body because my n is used for something else. So large multi-body problems is considered to be rather difficult to handle. So physicists have a very good idea. They said, you know, well, let's take an average. Maybe this average, the x-bar, 
will be able to represent each individual one in some way. So, uh, so what Dawson did in '75 was looking at this diffusion, except his gamma, beta, and the sigma are not alpha dependent. So this alpha dependence is a we put in when we look at the, the problem. So then what he did was that he showed there is a law of large number, and uh, this turns out to be something called a measure value of the process. And then he also showed there is a central limit associated with that. <laughs> Limit to the number of the yeah, the number of the uh, the particles go to infinity. Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> the next one has something to do with real life, right? So here is like insurance. In recent years, in, people in insurance got more interested in this. They are looking at this is the traditional surplus model, except the premium rate. And uh, the, this claim size actually depends on a switching process. Now, the thought is that uh, basically, you know, they are not constant, but they are subject to some random environment. So the alpha can be used as a representation of a random environment to uh, give us, uh, you know, some more uh, ideas. Now you may ask why I want this guy. You want that because of the following fact that they use the alpha t2 models, something like El Nino La Nina uh, phenomena in uh, property insurance, uh, in economic condition, in employment uh, policy, and the certain epidemic uh, models in health. So all of them, they use that. The next one, uh, I know uh, in this department, some people are working on mass finance. So the problem is that if you have a stock model, you normally use a geometric Brownian motion, but the return rate and the volatility could depend on some factor process. So instead of, instead of uh, you know, fixed the constant, it's natural to ask this one to be, to be that. So in fact, my, my, uh, I, I know some uh, friends here know David Yao. David Yao, uh, XYZ, which is his trademark, Xun Yu Zhou now is at Columbia, and also my friend uh, Qing Zhang, they did a paper. Uh, when people were trying to use stochastic volatility, they write out a second stochastic differential equation to represent the volatility. But if you use this alpha t, you can produce the uh, volatility smile, just as simple as the another uh, stochastic differential equation. In fact, even simpler than that. All right. So now let's talk about the properties of this. <coughs> the properties. Uh, first property, perhaps, is the regularity. What I mean by regular is that you know, no finite explosion time. That is written in this formula. The probability of this guy going to infinity is zero. And uh, to paraphrase that, we can use a sequence beta n to be equal to the inf of the norm of this uh, xt. Well, by the way, the superscript x and alpha denote the initial condition. So that tells you for the continuous uh, initial uh, state, that's x for the d squared, you have alpha. So you let the norm of that equal to n. So basically, you are looking at the ball of a radius n. Then beta n is easily seen to be an increasing process. So beta n either go to infinity or bounded. If it's go to infinity, infinity almost surely, then you have the regularity. So you know, uh, the, the next question will be recurrence. So here I have a set. Suppose I have an open set here. Let me just draw a ball or something like this. I have a point here, depending on the initial condition alpha x. I ask the question whether or not I'll be able to return to this open set with compact closure 
uh, can I do that? Is the probability finite? If the probability is, is equal to one, we call that recurrent. Otherwise, we call that transient. And if the expected value, of course, this reaching time, this sigma here, is a random variable, is a random stopping time. So if the expected value of that is finite, we call that positive recurrent. Otherwise, it's no recurrent. So one of the things we can prove is the following technical thing. Basically, it says uh, the process is positive recurrent with respect to so here is a set, open set in the continuous state. Here is the discrete one. Uh, is recurrent with respect to that. It's the same thing as recurrent with respect to only one of the discrete state cross this D. Uh, likewise, we can say if it's recurrent with respect to D cross M, then it is recurrent with respect to any of the open set cross M. So put it another way, this is a really sort of class property. So now we have the definition of recurrence. We ask the question, do we have a criterion to tell us when will this be recurrent or positive recurrent? Interesting enough, the answer is given by a solution of a Poisson system of equations. This is not a one equation. This is the system of equations. L is the elliptic operator. So here is a function that equal to negative one. If you have this condition fulfilled, then you have a positive recurrence. Uh, also, vice versa. If this one is con satisfied, you have a positive recurrence. If you have a positive recurrence, then this condition is satisfied. So it's a necessary and a sufficient condition. What else can you say? Suppose u is equal to the expected value of the reach, the time of reach this, uh, you know, this uh, open set. Then, then u satisfy the following Dirichlet problem. In fact, that not only is a the solution of the Dirichlet problem, but it's the smallest positive solution. So characterize that in a very precise way. All right. So how how do we prove that? Maybe uh, uh, I will just say very quickly because you know I, I know that for each talk we, we need to say a few words about the proof, right? So the first the first thing is that you you take the the difference of this. You write down that. Uh, so this give you this equation. This equation in uh, probability is called the Dinkins formula. If you think about integration or calculus, that's a fundamental theorem of calculus. So in a way, you can think about this as a fundamental theorem in the stochastic setup. And the right-hand side, according to, if this one is equal to minus one, then you just have the upper limit. And then you, you get rid of this term, you switch around, you get this inequality, then you take the limit as n go to infinity and the t goes to infinity, then you show this, in fact, is finite. Now, uh, then how do you show that this is the smallest positive solution? You look at uh, this boundary value problem, Dirichlet boundary value problem. It has two boundaries. One is this natural boundary. The other one is uh, a boundary at the norm equal to n. And you get a sequence of them. Once you get the sequence, you take the difference of two consecutive one, and then you show the series is convergent. And then you use the Harnack theorem to conclude that U, in fact, is a solution of the uh, system of PDEs. And finally, you use the maximal principle to show you know, uh, U is the smallest positive solution. You don't have a smaller one. All right. So I will skip the, uh, the uh, necessary condition part. Now, once you have a positive recurrence, then what do you know? Once you have a positive recurrence, the next thing you can get is our ergodicity. Basically, you have an invariant measure. So how do you show the invariant measure? This is the very geometric. So what we did was 
was that we, we look at the two cylindrical regions, right? The two concentrical uh, cylinders. One is the outer cylinder, one is the inner cylinder. So you, 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 uh, on, the, on this, you also have the discrete state, one, two, three. And uh, then you start from the ground state, from the state one, you go around. The first time it returns to the ground state, the outer cylinder, you call that one cycle is completed. So you do this, you construct cycles. Uh, you will see why the cycles are important. So I get this zeta zero, zeta two, zeta two, zeta four, and so on and so forth. I get the cycles. Once I get the, the cycles, I can do the sampling. I sample, I have a continuous process. Now I'm using this to construct a discrete process. The discrete process turns out to be a discrete time Markov chain. So there is a invariant measure for that. I can show the convergence. Then using this uh, discrete uh, Markov chain as a, as a bridge, we show the existence of uh, the invariant measure for this two component process. So once you get that, then you can get law of large number type of result. Suppose my f is, is a measurable function. I take 1 over t, the integral from 0 to t, then with probability 1, this one should converge to f bar, where f bar is an average with respect to the stationary measure of the uh, invariant measure of the switching diffusion. And suppose I have a Cauchy problem, a system of Cauchy problem, PDEs, but a system with initial condition like this, then I can show the solution of this actually goes to the average of those f. So for stability, uh, I think I have to uh, skip most of the part because I don't really have much time to do that part. So let me go on to the uh, explosion, suppression, and the stabilization part. So I'm going to skip that. Let me say the problem formulation is very simple. Let me begin with the following. <clears throat> I have a x, it's vector valued, and uh, here I have a differential equation which depends on the switching process, even no diffusion at this point. Now, the problem is that the f grows faster than linear. So I only have a local solution, I don't have a global solution. But my control objective is that <coughs> I need to build up some feedback control so that I can bring this one down to stability. So basically, asymptotically, I want this one go to zero. <laughs> it's not an optimal control, but I, I just want to drive this to zero. <clears throat> the problem is that how do you, how do you design this uh, feedback control? So here, f can be a continuous function. Well, let's see why you ask the question like this. Let, let's look at the following example. This is a very simple, maybe sophomore calculus class or differential equation class. You solve it, you get the following solution. There's nothing wrong with it. It looks all oh, okay, except there is a time, tau, equal to log two. At that time, the solution blow up, go into infinity. So there is a finite explosion time, right? So if you put the log two here, you see the denominator becomes zero. So that, that's, that's, that's the problem. But I really want to stabilize that. Here I, I only have a local solution. Everything just go to that point. I, I can't continue from there. The question is, can we get a global solution? And how can we actually stabilize that? So that's the question we, we ask. 
So two things are needed. The first thing is we need to extend that to a global solution. Secondly, we need to stabilize that. So the two things are uh, accomplished by using you know, some feedback controls. Interesting enough, the feedback controls are brown emotions, or rather noise process. <laughs> so, so let me mention some of the work, not, not the, for this part. In Hasminsky's uh, Hasminsk book, he did a stabilized 2D system with 2 wet noise. And uh, Arnold, uh, you know, the, the, the conference you are attending is in honor of him, actually. X dot equal to AX can be stabilized by zero mean stationary process, even only if the trace is less than zero. And the mouse work established a general stabilization result for Brownian motion noise under linear growth condition. And so on and so forth. This is my colleague's work uh, treating one sided growth condition. Uh, here is, is our result on getting necessary and sufficient condition for stability. Now, let's come back to the diffusion case. So, here I have this. If I write down the xt, the solution, I have that plus sigma times w. This is actually the geometric Brownian motion. The stock model is like this. So if sigma square is greater than 2 mu, then this one will be less than 0. Then the whole thing will be stable. Now this, this, this is the nothing, but this guy is called Lyapunov exponent. So you are, what you are getting is the Lyapunov exponent actually is less than 0. By the way, for a stock market model, this won't happen, you know. So you, you actually, uh, you, you don't really have a stability. If it's stable, nobody will invest in the stock market. So, so what is the idea of doing the stabilization? That really comes as follows. Uh, what we do is that we add some function in fact, the beta here has the following property. It really outgrow the growth factor is faster than this original F process, F function. And uh, this is the part one. By adding that part, you get a global solution. And then you add a linear diffusion. Now, of course, here, depending on the switching, then you stabilize that. So I'm going to show some pictures. So here is the model or the problem. You see this one has a finite explosion time, so is this one. So one of them is a log two, the other one is log three times. So then uh, what do you do is you, you add a perturbation or noise of x square. You know, the, the function is basically outperform the, the f part. Once you put in that, you, you actually get a global solution. And then you put a linear diffusion, you, you get the, the stability. So let's see. When you add the, 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 uh, the noise, the first part, you see this one is doing that, but it's not going to infinity. If you draw the picture of the, pre, uh, you know, the original system, you see that actually it's going to infinity. Now, then, after you add the linear diffusion, the thing actually dies down, going to zero asymptotically. You get the stability for that. <laughs> All of this can be proved. I, I just here show some picture. So the last part I'm going to show, I only have a few minutes. So I'm going to show uh, some numerical approximation for control and the switching diffusion games. So here I just have some picture for uh, numerical solution for, for a game problem, but here just so the, the value function. But th th that's not our uh, concern here. So for, for optimal control of a diffusion, the problem was done by Kushner in his early work starting from 70s, and the, the book of Kushner and the Dupree summarized the most uh, recent approach using uh, Mar uh, Markov chain approximation. Now, when the switching is added, the problem was done by 
uh, Ching Shu Song, my former student, and one of my colleagues, we and together we, you know, look at the, the regime switching, jump diffusion switching case. Now, now for the control the switching diffusion, we put a stopping time. What is the stopping time? I'm looking at a one dimensional system. And the stopping time is whenever you reach the boundary, you, you do the control so that I'm looking at from minus b to b. Whenever you reach the boundary minus b or b, you stop. So one dimensional thing just for simplicity. Then I write down the cost function and uh, you know the, this one is for the cost uh, you know on the boundary what, what do you do with it and then we can write down the so-called uh, value function and uh, formally the value function this inf stuff satisfy the following so-called uh, hamilton jacobi bauman equation in this case actually is system of uh, hamilton jacobi bauman equations now the question is how do you actually solve it you solve it by using Markov chain approximation. You build a control the Markov chain so that that convergence to the diffusion, control the diffusion, and also the cost and the value functions also converge. Uh, I will skip this part, but the, let me just show you all of this are not really what I want to talk about. I really want to talk about the rate of convergence, how fast that converges. Kushner's approximation has been there for a long time, since 70s, late 70s. But nobody looked at the rate of convergence for a quite long time, until 1989, one of my colleague, Manaudi, uh, who looked at the problem, basically using nonlinear PDE techniques. And later on, the, the master of uh, nonlinear PDE, Nick Krilov, got interested in that. He published the first paper in 2000, and it continues that with his uh, former student, uh, Hong Ji Dong. And they, they did a number of things to show the rate of convergence. And uh, all of this are purely anal uh, analytic techniques using analysis. Uh, nonlinear PD stuff. You know, with, with uh, Qing Shuo, we actually look at the problem from a probabilistic point of view. Using Markov chain approximation, using strong approximation, uh, sort of like a Hungarian uh, construction of the, 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 you know, strong approximation technique, we obtained the rate of convergence, which is similar to what they have done in Krilov's work. Uh, but they don't have a switching, we do have a switching built in. So in this uh, process, we use the so-called relaxed control is some kind of measure. Uh, and then we use the strong approximation, and then we did the boundary uh, perturbation. One of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, byproduct is actually we obtained the following thing. In, in Kushner and the Depress book, they mentioned, you know, in when you're doing this uh, control problem, sometimes you encounter the following problem. So this one is the control the diffusion. Now this one is the stopping time. You reach the boundary B, you stop. Uh, this one is your approximation. The approximation is very good. But what happened is that the this guy actually reached the boundary at this point. So if you look at this boundary and this boundary, they are far off. So they call this tangency problem. And uh, we showed in this, prob in this case that the tangency problem would not happen if the system has certain properties. And uh, later on, Qing Shuo continued on that uh, and uh, looked over, you know, what is you know, the necessary and sufficient condition for continuity of value function. In fact, more like a sufficient condition for continuity of value function. But I think I'm already over my time, so I, I pretty much just want to conclude the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>